about a, a great initiative uh, being done by the CSCMP. Uh, they've got on uh, Thursday, November the 6th, they're having what they call a student shadow day. It's an opportunity uh, for a supply, you know, supply chain student or for you guys to host a supply chain student for one day, providing a glimpse into, into the careers, into the automotive logistics world. We all know how important it is to, to bring the new people in. Um, Sometimes, you know, even I, you know, I, I publish Automotive Logistics magazine, and when people hear, oh, Louis works for an automotive magazine, everyone comes up to me, what is it? You know, what magazine? What cars do you drive or take photos of? And I say, no, it's Automotive Logistics, and they'll say, oh. <laughs> and I think that's what, you know, we have to uh, drive the message across about how important, how dynamic automotive is. You know, it's one of the world's most global industries. It's, it's one of the leading manufacturing industries, and we need to get that across to people who are starting their careers. And what's one of the most important aspects of any manufacturing industry, of any industry, as the governor of Guanajuato said today? Uh, it's logistics and supply chain. So what we're trying to do, or what CSCMP are trying to do, is to encourage people to, to join our industry. And the best way to do it is to help them to understand what a great, dynamic, important industry it is. So com some of the companies already committed to hosting students on the Student Shadow Day include Menlo Logistics, Ryder, Penske, uh, Protrans, Active On Demand, XPO, and many others. But I think it would be great for your company uh, whether, you know, whatever you do, you know, for a, if you're a logistics company, perhaps even car makers or suppliers, uh, to join this, uh, host the student, uh, supply chain student day. Uh, so I think, you know, it's something that I'd like to encourage. Uh, Danette Beltnik um, from Intiva is, is, you know, our contact here. If you want to contact Danette, uh, or, or you can do it through me. Uh, or through the net to, to join this uh, student shadow day. So November the 6th, invite a student into your office, into your, into your workplace to see what a great industry you guys work in. So uh, I just think that that's a, such an important initiative. And maybe the net, if you can just stand up so the people, so they can find you more easily if anyone wants more, anyone wants more details on that. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it good to have friends like that, doesn't it? Yeah. So uh, onto the session. This time we're looking at the, it's a, firstly it's the supplier supply chain stream. So if you're interested in vehicle logistics, which as everyone knows is the easy part of logistics, uh, that's in the the other room. So this is specifically supply supply chain, um, and we're talking about Mexico. I don't know why, I'm not sure what's happening in Mexico, if there's any kind of business being done out there, but that's our subject of choice. And, uh, and I think, you know, we, we mistakenly put the challenges of supplying Mexican plants, but I think maybe the session should be how easy it is to supply uh, Mexican plants, how easy it is to ship goods backwards and forwards into Mexico. So we've got a great panel of logistics experts uh, to tell us what they're doing, what their companies are doing, their experiences, their solutions uh, for, for the shipment transportation of parts in and out of Mexico to support the growing uh, automotive industry uh, in Mexico. So, um, so we've got, you know, re represented in the panel are Ryder, Orbis, UPDS, and Penske. So I think we've got some great experience, knowledge, uh, uh, to hear from these different companies. So I'd like to welcome to the stage the first speaker of this session, Bradley Scroggin, Director of Customer Logistics Automotive for Rider Supply Chain Solutions. Thanks, Brad. Good morning. I'd like to thank everyone for coming and thank Louis and Automotive Logistics for having me here today. It's great to be with everyone and a uh, great first session this morning. I learned a lot myself. So as we talk about uh, Ryder's role in the Mexico and the challenges and, and the ease, uh, just a quick background on uh, what Ryder's doing in Mexico. We're happy to have celebrated our 20th anniversary this year. It began in 1994 down in Mexico. So uh, pleased to have that celebration this year. Currently we have over 2,400 employees in Mexico operating 16 distribution centers over 6 million square feet that we're managing. Approximately 730 pieces of equipment so 
uh, obviously in different facets uh, as we go and we kind of hit on some of that and talk about some of the challenges we faced. But just kind of a quick overview of, of where we are in Mexico. As we look at our primary locations, and I think this is a good uh, point for us to kind of talk about our infrastructure and the infrastructure challenges we see in Mexico, and a lot of that was talked about in the first session. You know, obviously you can see for us, you know, we're in, the, you know, the primary cities, we're operating at the border, uh, all the key cities where you see um, the Bahia area, the, uh, the automotive OEMs are there. And for us, is the in, big focus is the infrastructure, and there's a lot of investment going on. And like I say, that's been hit on significantly. You know, there's approximately $340 billion worth of investment the Mexican government's making now and over the next few years. So we're spending a lot of time. And, and like I say, there was a lot of discussion about the rail and the ports. And for us, you know, it, it's, you know the biggest is, is the highways and, and leading to these areas, especially the Bahia area, where we see a lot of uh, need and improvement in the, the roads, the bridges. And one of the things we see as we think about the challenges is some areas are, are further along than other areas. Some areas need more development. And as we look at our challenges and what we're doing is, is good planning and, and, and going to those areas, seeing where potentially the infrastructure isn't where it needs to be, where we've got to take some extra steps. And for us, you know, as we think about infrastructure, it's all about the planning as you know, capacity is sometimes, it's growing down there, is growing quicker than the infrastructure can keep up with. And for us, it's looking at individual markets, individual locations, and thinking about uh, what we're doing and planning for that and, and working on that. Uh, next, as we, as we look at warehousing, you know, Ryder operates the 16 distribution centers. And you know, what's key is, is the security at the warehouses as we look at the challenges. Obviously, for you know, high-value goods or import-export material, taking extra precautions you know, the closed caption TVs, uh, the biometric entries, biometric entries into the facilities, uh, the special precautions we're taking and we need to take on the shipping documents to make sure that's proper. Uh, but for us, the warehousing is key too because there's no LTL market in Mexico. So as we look at consolidating, you know, multiple suppliers on milk runs, and potentially uh, taking those to consolidation points, having a, uh, you know, a strong and a planned out warehousing and cross-docking uh, plan is, is important for us and some of the challenges we've seen as we look at the growth down there is real focused on uh, the warehousing and, and managing that, you know, tying into our transportation network. As, as we look at our transportation, what we do, Currently, Ryder uh, has a group of core carriers that we partner with that operate Ryder equipment. We also contract with over 150 employees. And as us, as we think about our transportation challenges, and it was said a, a lot, is the flow of the freight and to keep it moving. And, and the, the uh, gentleman from Landstar talked a lot about that. And we see that as a, uh, for us as well. And as we go and we, you know, work with uh, different companies, mapping out the flow of your material is a key. You know, they keep the, the goods moving. Don't let them sit or, you know, making sure they're sitting in a secure uh, facility. Defining carrier times for us is key. So as we, we look at that and we sit down, you know, mapping that out and we look at our transportation, that, that's a, a big focus for us. You know, it, also, as we look at our drivers, doing good background checks as far as, you know, in going probably more in depth in, in Mexico than within the U.S. helps us minimize security and theft issues as well. Um, when we are working with the plants and, and the suppliers, having a good open line of communication and, a, and you know, and a good escalation processes, we're often seeing delays with our drivers at the suppliers at the plants, but having a good upfront communication, open lines of uh, uh, dialogue, how we're gonna handle that upfront has been good for us. We see in many cases where we're not doing that as well as we should, uh, we, we're not as successful. So for us, good communication, good escalation processes to help reduce delays. You know, it, it is always, as we think about time down there in Mexico, us in, in the U.S. automotive industry, we're ultra sensitive about time. And, and that's not maybe the case in Mexico. So managing those expectations when we're, when we're looking at our, our transportation capabilities and, and networks is, is a big point for us. 
the border. And once again, you know, this is a carryover. Ryder manages 133,000 border crossings each year. In, in our network, as we look, and we think one of the keys, you know, often um, the border become a black hole. And, you know, for us, we put tons of emphasis on it throughout the network. And, you know, like I say, this is a continuation is, is managing that border. It's the, you know, for us, it's the key. And, and we talk about transit time management. And, and for us, it's not just about shrinking and reducing your transit time management. It's predictive transit times as well. So we want to be able to be consistent and predictive in what those transit times are getting across the border for us. So as we work with different companies and different suppliers, a focus on that. Obviously, you know, we, we talk about having CTPAT and fast certification for our carriers is a key. You know, as we bring stuff out of Mexico, you know, we, we have a, we're, we're the trailer dust set and we talk about keeping the freight moving. You know, we have a, a, a significant more security, guard dogs and, and that kind of stuff. So when the, the freight does sit, you know, we overkill really the security at the border in the Nuevo Laredo. But transit times, like I say, uh, not just reducing them, but predictive. And I, I think sometimes that's as important as just reducing it. Uh, as you work with, you know, we've seen this as we work with your, uh, the border crossing, having a proven customs broker is key. You know, making sure you're training the shippers on documentation is another key for us. Uh, setting up pre-established schedules. Because another thing is we think about reducing transit times, having that paperwork and a good uh, flow through and pre-established schedules and managing those expectations up front are other keys for us as we've tried to work through some of our challenges as we come in and out of Mexico. The, the next part we kind of talk about is our control tower. And in, for us, we have our control tower in Nuevo Laredo, Mexico. And you know, they're bilingual there, controlling the freight as it moves in Mexico. And, and the key in this is for us and the success and where we've helped reduce some of our challenges is we have a control tower facility in Dallas and, and here in Detroit as well, and good open communication lines between those groups. S using the same system has helped minimize our challenges, standardized work. So it's not just enough to have a control tower there, but you know, a big focus is keeping these groups working, communicating together. It's helped us reduce some of our challenges. It's not always perfect, but it, but it does help. And, and, you know, the, the final slide here, as we talk about security, you know, it goes without saying, you have to be vigilant. You have to set clear expectations, set the requirements for your carriers. What is the requirements with GPS as you go through? Real-time driver updates. So these are some of the things as, you know, we talk about security, you know, we keep the freight flowing. You know, you, you have your security measures at, you know, at your warehouses with your, uh, you know, closed caption TVs, your biometrics, but, you know, establishing with the trucking companies and the carriers, what are the rules of engagement on this? How is it going to work as far as GPS and real-time transit? So that is a, you know, quick overview as, uh, you know, we, we think about what Ryder's doing and some of the challenges. So I look forward to... Uh, receiving uh, questions during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brad, for giving us uh, an overview of what Ryder are doing and how Ryder are handling the uh, Mexico supply chain. And next up, to give us a, perhaps a, a, a slightly more you know, focus on one area of, uh, of Mexico. I'd like to welcome to the stage Bob Peterson, Senior Marketing Manager for Albis Corporation. Thanks, Lee. Uh, yeah, as he said, uh, it'll be a little bit of a different look. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with, I work for Orbis Corporation, and we are the largest plastic returnable, or returnable plastic packaging provider in North America for the automotive sector. Uh, we have 10 plants across the U.S., and I'm very excited to uh, share with all of you that in about two months we'll have our first facility in Mexico uh, in Salado to help 
support the, the growth down in Mexico. So we're very excited about that. Um, what I kind of put together today is just kind of looking at all the different challenges that we've had as a supplier into the Mexico market. I've tried to only include the ones that are much more specific to Mexico. Um, as we looked at it, uh, there's really three different buckets that you can kind of put a lot of our challenges into. Uh, just around the distance, uh, until a couple months from now, a lot of the packaging still comes from the U.S., and that's pretty much across all of the plastic suppliers uh, that are feeding into Mexico. Uh, there's very little local production of plastic packaging, reusable packaging in Mexico. The standardization. Um, when any of the OEMs or, or other uh, automakers came to North America or into the U.S., everyone just quickly adopted the English, the, the English metric, uh, build it around the 53-foot trailer. As we've gone into, as the OEMs have come into Mexico, it's been much more German and, and Japanese influence and the influence and the push for looking at, at least considering the metric footprint. And then the third one is just keeping up with the rapid growth. Um, as the U.S. market has come back, uh, there's a huge demand for plastic and, and, and packaging, and then similarly to Mexico. So just keeping up with everything has been a real challenge. So to get into a little bit more of the details, when, you, when you're looking at the distance, obviously freight maximization, it's always a, it's a buzzword, you know, maximizing your cube, uh, not only within the container, but within the, within the trailer. Um, but on the longer distance hauls, it's even more important. So do you go to collapsible handheld containers? Are you using... Um, you know, the standard in the past was 208 bulk bins on a truck collapsed. Well, we've now gotten it to where we can get 254 by, you know, redesigning our packaging to fit around some of those longer loops. Container management, uh, a lot of discussion yesterday around RFID. Um, you know, I really think it, it gets to that point of you got to start to treat the packaging like a part. Um, I think it was Renee from GM that, that used that yesterday, and I think once that mentality is taken, uh, you, you eliminate some of those losses and you, and you start to find out where your packaging is going. Uh, managing border crossings, no shock. We've heard a lot about that today. Probably hear a lot more about that uh, as we go through the rest of the day, so I won't uh, add any of ours. Hopefully with our plan in Mexico, we'll have a few less things crossing the border and we'll free up some of that capacity. On the last one is the part protection. Um, just different environments down in Mexico versus uh, you know, some of the North America, Detroit, Canada markets, uh, not as cold, uh, but also some of the longer distance um, and some of the new materials that are being used in the vehicles has kind of changed the, the way the dunnage needs to be designed uh, and the different materials that need to be used. Looking at the standardization, uh, as, as I said before, North America has been built around the 53-foot trailer. Uh, how do you maximize that trailer going back and forth? Um, you know, when you take the pallet positions within a truck, you get about a 30% better uh, density when you ship on a 4548 in North America because of that 53-foot trailer than you would with a 1,200, which is kind of the standard uh, metric sizes. So there's definitely that battle back and forth. But the last, the last bullet there is you, we need to make the right decision for the entire supply chain. So how much of it is going to go on sea container and come, come over from either Europe or Japan or, or Asia somewhere uh, versus what you're going to be able to supply locally? Uh, how much of it's going to actually come from the U.S. or how much of it is going to go from Mexico back into the U.S.? So looking at it holistically from the entire view, not just one move uh, from, you know, if there's certain parts are coming from Germany, do we want to really dictate the entire supply chain once it gets here? on something that's going to, you know, supply some great inefficiencies that are going to be difficult to overcome. And lastly, it's just the rapid growth. Um, you know, just about double-digit growth on the, uh, as the production increases. And, and the three main drivers for us and any of the other packaging suppliers, there's three major ones. It's the vehicle launches. So every time there's a new launch, there's a new budget for packaging. Uh, new designs uh, and changes around that and keeping up with that. Obviously new plants. Uh, every time there's a new plant, it's, it's, it's like a couple of launches all together and, and those get very exciting and extremely hectic and busy for us. But then you also have the production increases and these can usually be the toughest because they can come out of kind of the middle of nowhere. Um, you know, we either get SOP dates for launches and uh, the plants are obviously well publicized. But when the volume ups and the, and the production increases come, they don't need thousands of pieces of packaging. You might need 20 pieces of packaging. 
Um, and so managing that uh, and balancing that and, and getting those through efficiently and on time um, is, is a great challenge for us in the packaging world. So I think with that, I'm done. So I'll uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Bob. Packaging, container management, a big area for, for every uh, are important uh, part of any supply chain. So uh, I'm sure looking at what's happening in Mexico on that point is going to be very important. Uh, next up, one of, the f one of the subjects that always turns up in, uh, in any discussion about Mexican logistics is a multimodal. So uh, I'd like to welcome to the, to the stage Mike Parker, the president of UPDS. Thanks for your time today. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with, with Union Pacific Distribution Services, or UPDS, we provide rail-based transportation solutions uh, to a variety of industries across North America. Specific to the automotive industry, our primary role is as an intermodal service provider. So we manage a, a comprehensive transportation network uh, to provide door-to-door -door shipments of auto parts using intermodal service. Uh, to give you some, some uh, idea of scale, you know, last year we managed about 200,000 shipments of intermodal auto parts shipments, um, and most of these crossed the border, either southbound shipments to a Mexico assembly plant or northbound shipments from a supplier to an assembly plant in the U.S. or Canada. And as the largest intermodal service uh, provider dedicated to the automotive industry, you know, we've spent the last 25 years developing the ex expertise, capability, and innovation necessary to meet the automotive industry's requirements. This morning, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking about the growth in Mexico. It, it's been evolving quickly and it doesn't look like it's gonna slow down anytime soon. And, and with that comes some pretty unique challenges. Today I'm gonna to kind of walk you through four challenges that we see from an intermodal transportation perspective. Um, the first is really transportation infrastructure. So, so to meet the requirements of the automotive industry and the OEMs, you know, not only do you need a fast, reliable, and efficient service, uh, but you need to manage a network that has options so that you can quickly respond to dis disruptions. Um, you know, some of you may recall in 2010 there was Hurricane Alex, and it, it, it disrupted some of the major highways going into Mexico along with one of the primary rail crossings at Laredo. It took it out of service for six days. And, and, and Mexico isn't entirely isolated from events in the U.S. either. Um, if you look at, you know, the winter weather that we've experienced this past year, you know, that has a significant impact on the overall network and can impact the ability to service uh, the OEM plants. Uh, the next challenge that I'll talk about is really capacity or, or bimodal capacity. You know, because of all the growth in production and trade, uh, you know, this creates new challenges for capacity. I'll touch a little bit about customs. You know, we've touched on it in some of the different sessions. The customs process, the border crossing uh, comp, uh, process can be pretty complex. There's a lot of parties involved. It requires very careful planning. And, and just one small error in that process can, can cause delays and can have an impact uh, to production. And then lastly, I'll, I'll touch a little bit on security. You know, not only is it important to have damage-free and, and safe transportation, uh, but security, all, there's also security concerns associated with serving the plants in Mexico. Uh, so starting with uh, the network infrastructure, you know, from our perspective as an intermodal provider, transportation is really all about the network you can build. 
Um, you know, we found uh, that, you know, you can't anticipate every type of service disruption. I mean, something's always going to happen. So it's critical to have redundancies to provide alternative options when things occur. Um, so some of the things that UPDS employs, uh, you know, we look at a variety, alternative, a variety of alternative options to support Mexican assembly plants. Um, this includes crossing the border by both rail and truck. So although we, we do advocate rail solutions, um, we, we think it's important to have kind of a healthy balance of both rail and truck border crossings. You know, each mode has its own distinct advantages and it's really important to keep both op options open. Um, when we look specifically at rail crossings into Mexico, um, I, you know, Brian Bowers, if you heard him earlier, mentioned, you know, the Mexican railroads don't have quite the redundancies in their networks as the U.S. railroads. Um, so we work with both the primary carriers, rail carriers in Mexico, the Ferromex and the KCSM, and with them we support four different intermodal border crossings, uh, and that redundancy is important. If something happens, if, there, if there's a delay in one area, how quickly can you reconfigure the network to keep uh, the plants running? And also, uh, as the largest purchaser of intermodal drayage in Mexico, you know, we think it's really important to keep a very diverse and healthy truck carrier base. Um, you know, like in the U.S., we've seen some challenges on the trucking side in Mexico, and managing that, that customer base, or that, that drayage base is really important. Uh, investments to support growth is critical. You heard a little bit about some of the investment plans this morning. Um, there's a lot of focus, especially in the U.S., uh, but the Mexican railroads are also investing uh, uh, at record levels to support future growth. You know, the Ferromex has made significant terminal track and equipment upgrades in order to support their new cross-border intermodal service to Monterey over the Eagle Pass Gateway. And the KCSM, you know, I think in the second half of this year, they're going to be laying 30 miles of new track. And, and so as the automotive industry continues to grow, it's critical for all the players involved, the OEMs, the suppliers, uh, the logistics providers like UPDS, to work together, identify requirements, and, and make sure transportation and logistics doesn't become a barrier to growth. Uh, looking next at modal capacity, um, you know, when I'm talking about modal capacity today, I'll, I'll primarily focus on intermodal equipment, you know, the containers coming in and out of Mexico using intermodal service. Um, you know, we often hear Mexico referred to as, as a single region. And, and I think um, from our experience, we've learned that it's much more complicated than that. You know, our, our view of Mexico Simplistically, you know, we look at it in terms of four distinct geographic shipping regions. In the north, uh, or you, have in, uh, you have the western Mexico, northern Mexico, and central regions. And these regions tend to have fairly large production bases. Um, they rely heavily on exports and, and often tend to be deficit of containers and capacity. Uh, in the south, it's, it's, it's more of an importing region, uh, and there tends to be uh, a surplus of capacity. And, and the interconnectedness of these different regions can vary pretty dramatically. Uh, excuse me. Um, and, and, and so as production continues to grow, it's really important to look at each region and make sure you have, you know, you're managing the network for each region specifically, that you have the balance you need. You know, this will keep costs low and this will ensure capacity going forward. Uh, there was a recent article in the Journal of Commerce that said intermodal rates, you know, across all industries in that north-south corridor from Mexico are up 8% year over year. And a lot of that was attributed to some of the imbalance from the growing trade, you know, the imbalance from the, to cover the cost of repositioning equipment. You know, at UPDS, we work really hard uh, and plan carefully to, to manage our balance within each region. So a lot of times we'll match OEM freight, production parts with service parts, rack returns, uh, uh, tier parts to promote balance. Um, we'll even work with other uh, providers who serve different industries uh, 
to ensure each region has a balance and that we have the capacity and the ability to keep down costs. Uh, customs, you know, we've heard a lot about customs today. It, it, it can be a complicated and, and burdensome process. Um, you know, there's a lot of parties involved. There's a lot of handoffs. And it, it just takes one minor misstep or error uh, to cause a delay. Uh, um, you know, what, what we found from our experience is, is you can really leverage technology when it comes to customs in the border crossing uh, for efficiency. Um, UPDS, you know, we, we've been crossing automotive freight across the border for about 25 years. We do more than 3,000 border crossings each week. And, you know, we leverage technology to get scalability in our processes. Um, it, it's fairly easy to micromanage a few shipments, but when you start crossing hundreds or thousands a week, uh, you know, technology can really be helpful. Um, our internal visi visibility platform we integrate with all the stakeholders, the, the plant, the OEM, the railroads involved, the trucking companies, customs agencies, uh, customs agencies, and even the brokers to make sure everybody has the visibility they need at the right time for a seamless border crossing. Uh, the, last, uh, the last challenge I'll touch on is, is security. Um, you know, certainly there are unique uh, security challenges when, when dealing, uh, when supporting the plants in Mexico, you know, from our perspective, uh, there probably isn't a silver bullet. There's, there's some big issues here that I think are more broader than, than transportation. And really the key is uh, preventative planning. Um, you know, the first step, or we spend a lot of time developing very rigorous SOPs. So you heard earlier about looking at drive times. I mean, we work with each one of our underlying carriers to set expectations and guidelines for handling automotive freight in a very efficient manner. Um, moving double stack containers does have some inherent security benefits. You know, if you look at how uh, uh, containers are positioned in, the, in, a, in a rail well car, the bottom container, the wells come up and it prevents the door from being opened. And, and usually that top container is out of reach. Um, the Transportation Ministry of Mexico, you know, they, they put out some statistics and they estimate that le less than 5% of the cargo theft in Mexico occurs when it's on rail. Uh, when we move uh, over the road or by highway, which we continue to do a lot of, uh, we, we also have to take safeguards. Um, we work really closely, you know, we certify our carriers, uh, this includes CTPAT, you know, we establish um, pretty robust SOPs, you know, at some locations uh, our carriers will only tra traverse through in daylight hours, in other areas we use convoys. Um, I think it was pointed out earlier, really the key, you know, one of the best things you can do is keep the freight moving. You know, we try to do that where, wherever we can, minimize any downtime, and, and if there has to be a stop, make sure we're doing it uh, at a secure location. Uh, so to wrap it all up, you know, supplying the Mexico assem Mexican assembly plants does have some unique challenges. Um, from a transportation perspective, uh, you know, we think it really comes down to employing an effective transportation network. So that includes redundancies to avoid serv uh, service interruptions. It, in, it, in, it includes a focus on your balance of freight to make sure you have the capacity um, to support growth and that you can reduce cost. You know, it's leveraging technology to, to drive efficiencies through customs and, and a pretty robust focus on security. You know, as the, the transportation environment continues to evolve and more and more production goes to Mexico, it's really incumbent for everybody to work together, you know, the OEMs, the logistics providers, the, the railroads, the truckers, everybody to come together and make sure logistics and transportation is really at the forefront of some of this planning. It doesn't become a barrier and becomes, and instead can become a source of competitive advantage. So with that, I thank you for your time and look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mike.
uh, giving us a better understanding perhaps of, of some of the rail issues and, and advantages. And next up, uh, I'd like to welcome to the podium uh, Jeff Bullard, Senior VP of Operations for the Central Region for Penske Logistics. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Um, I appreciate being here. Louis, thanks for the introduction. It's probably been 10 years since I've been here last. I think last time I was here, you had me on a panel, too. <laughs> so, uh, well-worn path. The, uh, when I was here last, I was with General Motors. And um, in, in that gap of about 10 years, I spent most of my time outside of automotive. And so what was interesting to me, outside of automotive, a few things just in general. The supply chain within automotive is much more complex than any other industry you're going to find. So people in this room that can, if you can do it here, you can do it anywhere in your sleep. That's been my experience anyways. Um, what was also surprising to me is that Penske Logistics was not a very well-known commodity, to be perfectly honest, outside of automotive. When I was at General Motors, they were a very large, established provider of services, but other industries, it wasn't the case. So just humor me for a second. This is a bit of a, a commercial. In terms of the scope of our services, we are, uh, a lot of people see our yellow trucks, but we are a global logistics company. We operate in North America, US, Canada, Mexico, of course. Uh, we are in Europe. We are in South America, Brazil is the center, and then we are in Asia as well with a growing office in China. Um, we have about 300 locations, a little over. Uh, we have 2,000 vehicles on the road, and that's in the U.S. So we have, of those 2,000 vehicles, we have about 3,000 drivers and a total population of employees of over 10,000. Our services, we provide, uh, we, we move the freight, we handle the freight in terms of warehousing, and then we design and optimize the freight in terms of our supply chain services. So it's a very robust set of services that I think the automotive community is well aware of, but surprisingly outside automotive, not so much. Uh, Mexico, I, one of the advantages or disadvantages of being the last guy is I feel like a lot of things I'm gonna talk about are new to you. I got to hear their pitches, so I get to steal some of the things they said and make it sound like it was my idea. Uh, but in, in terms of the outlook on Mexico, we are bullish on Mexico, I think, I imagine everybody in this room is. I certainly know you can't pick up any automotive trade magazine and not hear about the growth that's happening in Mexico. We've been there for 18 years. Um, the last year we've had 47% growth. Um, I will tell you the next year we anticipate a similar growth. And then uh, the, le the next five years, our, our plan is to experience double digit growth every year. And that's, that, that's a pretty conservative estimate. We have, um, We'll be at 2,000 plus people by quarter one of next year. Uh, we, we, we used to operate in Mexico, and we thought about Mexico as a, just an extension of the United States. Uh, we, we organizationally handled it as an extension of our, typically our West region. Um, this year, we've made a move recognizing the growth and recognizing what we think strategically Mexico represents. Um, we, we've made the decision to put in a separate infrastructure. We've appointed a managing director, Mike Cassidy, um, a longtime Penske employee as the managing director of Mexico, and we're building out and investing a large sum of money in our infrastructure and our capabilities in that country. We think it's a great opportunity uh, for both the, the, the 3PL side and, and the, uh, the shipper side, if you will, um, and, and obviously we're not alone. The, if you look at the Goldman Sachs estimate that it's gonna be the fifth largest economy by 2050, right now, just to put it in perspective, it's number 14. A little over a trillion dollars uh, a year in US dollars, and uh, it's expected to grow and grow pretty significantly here over the next coming decades. It ranks 53rd, I sound over academic right now, so I apologize, but it ranks 53rd on the Global competitive Competitiveness Index. And that index, it's interesting, I did a little bit of research on it, there are 12 pillars that a country gets evaluated on. And they're sort of building block pillars and then they get to more advanced pillars as economies grow in and expand. And what's interesting about Mexico is not necessarily the ranking of 53, that sounds sort of mid-packish. Um, but it's grown every single year over the last five years, it's improved. And what's really interesting is you start looking at its performance over the 12 pillars that they get graded on. And every pillar, it's improving. So those pillars are infrastructure stuff, education, you know, the things that make for a competitive economy and a robust economy across all pillars, excuse me, 
across all pillars, Mexico is improving. So those are good signs. And then you can see they're taking their, uh, the necessary um, steps to allow for free trade with other countries. So we think, we think it's a good spot to be. We've been there for over 18 years. We will continue to be there, and uh, we are growing rapidly. Every year, uh, we, we co-sponsor a study along with uh, several other firms, namely Capgemini Consulting and Penn State. Um, it's, a, it's an annual study. It's the 2015 study is about to come out in a couple weeks, so you're going to get a, a, a bit of a, a preliminary glimpse at some of the data. Uh, why we name it the 2015 study and it's 2014, I'm sure, there, sure there's some marketing uh, reason for it, but, but it is the 2015 study that's coming out. Um, not surprisingly, you, you look at why people that are moving to Mexico, it's not surprising to see U.S. companies migrate to Mexico. It's a well-worn path. It's been happening for a long time. Uh, but what's interesting is you start to see the nearshoring concept with Chinese companies or, or production that's in China today being resourced back into Mexico. And I, I'm sure that it depends on the commodity. Some people, some commodities make sense to do it, some don't. But we haven't seen this kind of jump uh, before. So you've got... You've got this concept of nearshoring as China's economy has taken off and the Asian economies have taken off and wages have gone up. Their principal competitive advantage is, is actually deteriorating. And the asset that Mexico has, the obvious asset, is its proximity to the largest, most dynamic economy on the face of the earth. So it, that, that asset doesn't go away. That, that strategic geographical advantage that Mexico has is, um, is, is real, it's significant, and I think it's, it's something that the rest of the world is now noticing as their wage structures start to escalate, the, uh, the competitiveness of, of Mexico is, is an obvious alternative. Reasons are, are pretty obvious. Lower cost, total cost, landed cost. Um, decreasing the, the supply chain, the time, which allows you all sorts of flexibility and better inventory savings, and then risk mitigation. Those are the primary reasons why companies are looking for to Mexico as an alternative low-cost country. That same study, um, we looked at the challenges in, in uh, logistics challenges in Mexico, and, and you can see on this wheel, these are the same or very similar points that the other panelists have, have brought up. And the, the, this is the, the, the verbatim uh, comments from the survey. So you start at the, at, I guess, at the upper left-hand quadrant, and the lack of quality infrastructure, it's been discussed. Um, I personally am not overly worried about it. It doesn't make it not a problem. <laughs> It just means that it's well recognized and there's a lot of activity going on. There's a lot of investment going on. Um, I think you know, it's not fast enough for anybody's liking, but it's happening. So that one, I, my, my gut tells me, would, would get taken care of. The limited use of IT, some of that is cultural in our opinion. Um, there's other practical reasons why there's a limited use of IT, and I'll give you an example. There's, you know, we, we have carriers that we, we want to put you know, more advanced technology for tracking in the, in the cab, and they're concerned about the piece that I'm gonna end with, which is the security aspects. So you've, you've got practical reasons why the, there's a lower adoption of IT, or of technology, I will say in general, and then you've got more cultural reasons why IT is not being accepted, or not as accepted as, as rapidly as we would want it to. And that, that really points to the need for coaching and mentorship of your carrier base. The low air, air transport penetration, again, this is, this is from a broad view of 700 companies. It, if you guys are transporting via air primarily, depending on the commodity, but I suspect you're trying to avoid that. Uh, that, that one I'm not as concerned about for this, this group. Uh, the expedite services in Mexico are pretty established and I don't think there's much of a problem getting stuff out when you need to. Uh, the, the one that is to me is the most concerning and the one that's, that's the most pressing is the regulatory and security related risks. If you think about sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, none of, this, none of the rest of this stuff really matters if, if I'm not safe and secure. And so to me, that, that's the one everybody I think on this panel has discussed it. It is real. Um, it's, you can't pick up a piece of paper it seems or a, a newspaper. And, and not read about, uh, about issues along the border and some of the organized crime. So they've got their challenges there. There are ways around it. Um, you've heard, I think, some people talk about, and I believe it's a design issue to, to get your way around it. It's, you've got to design in redundancy. You've got to design in intelligence so that you can avoid or minimize the, the security risk. Talk about that more, that, more about that in a minute. 
so it comes to sort of the way I wanted to end this, um, my part of this discussion, was to give you some practical recommendations. These are, I would argue, these are common sense. My experience is because it's common sense doesn't mean it's common practice. Um, I asked the team for, my team, for a list of things they would recommend that we could leave you with, with some, maybe some things that you could go do. And I got a, a list of 50, but I boiled it down to a few things that I thought, um, thought would be important. And carrier capacity is tight. Uh, it's, it's tight in the U.S. It is very tight in Mexico. Uh, with the growth in Mexico, it's going to get tighter. Uh, be, be proactive with it. Be a customer of choice. There are things you can do to, um, to, be, a carry, to, excuse me, to be a customer that carriers want to haul freight for. So I, I would encourage you to, to, to do things that are carrier friendly. Um, LTL is, is in some respects a non-existent mode down there, but if anybody thinks they're going to use LTL for parts that are critical, don't do it. <laughs> it's, it's, you're, you're gonna have, have problems. So you know, design yourself a multi-stop truckload, design yourself something different that will keep you off of whatever LTL market there is. The border, we've, again, everybody has mentioned the border in customs. Um, it is an issue. It doesn't operate 24-7. There are delays. Recognize it, design around it, design into it, uh, be smart about it. Um, the security piece, I, I think again, I feel redundant, everybody's mentioned it, but don't let the freight, bad stuff happens when it sits, so in your design, you know, put intelligence into the design so that the freight is moving. Don't have stuff hit the border an hour before it's gonna close and have it sit all night. I mean, just, you know, relatively common sense stuff to do, but you, 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 you gotta do it. It's important, it, it does matter. Um, the, the labor force, uh, it, it is a, we have found um, a very, a very um, conscientious, quality-driven, motivated labor force. It need, the labor force needs to be trained. That's an obvious statement, probably. It needs to be trained. However, <laughs> once you train them, you don't want them walking out the back door to go to somebody else. And so, with the growth in Mexico and what you're gonna see going forward, it's going to be, I think, even more pronounced. Uh, the average age, I think, in Mexico is 27 years, so it's a very young country. People with a lot of, a lot of time to work on an average standpoint. Um, they will move if you don't make them feel welcomed. It's a different culture, it's more familial. Um, you want to have HR policies that encourage retention because you don't want your hard-earned and, and, and one talented employees walking out the back door. So B, you know, your HR planning needs to contemplate retention strategies. And I think that is it. Thanks, appreciate the time. Look forward to talking to everybody soon. Thank you very much, Jeff, again, sharing some of the, uh, the issues that are involved for automotive logistics. Uh, in Mexico. So this is uh, your chance to ask the panel some questions or to make some comments, whether you agree, disagree, have different ways of doing things, or just if you've got a, a question that you wish to ask, uh, this is your opportunity. We're also using the, the live streaming, so if you're not in the room and want to ask a question, uh, or of course if you're in the room and you're just shy, uh, or if you were singing too much at the Motown uh, after the Glow Party and you can't talk, uh, then by all means use the, use the social media uh, to, to ask the question. So there's not too much time you left, so I'll, I'll throw it out quickly if there's anything from the, uh, from the floor to, to start it off. Hi, I'm Julie Gunter from Volkswagen, and I wanted to follow up with Jeff on this customer of choice idea that he had. What suggestions do you have to make the carriers more anxious for our freight. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think there's mentor them. Um, recognize that the procurement practices in the U.S. I'll speak primarily of the U.S. are not the same. The payment terms are not the same as they are in Mexico. It's more of a cash basis. People need money more quickly. Um, so 
do that and set up mentoring programs where you can work with carriers in order to improve their business. I mean, I, I think the definition of a good customer is you make that supplier, whether it's a carrier or a part supplier, you make that supplier better. And so I, I think in my humble experience in the United States, we take that for granted because we have a pretty established carrier base. Down in Mexico with a budding carrier base, which is not as sophisticated, I think the onus is on the customer to mentor that carrier. And I think the carriers that we've seen respond well to that. Okay, thank you. Paulo Monteiro, Volkswagen. Uh, also for Jeff, um, there is still a, a big difference between the northbound and the southbound uh, volumes. Uh, how did uh, Penske deal with this challenge? Well, <laughs> I, um, that's probably a subject we could spend a lot of time on. I think the, 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 the key to crossing the border, in, our, in my opinion, is Active management. Don't, I mean, technology, as I think Mike has mentioned from UPDS, the, the technology needs to be there. You can do a lot of things, make sure the paperwork is right, but active engagement on the border, both northbound and southbound, we have seen make the difference between something that can sit and something that actually will move. Um, this, it always seems, my, when I was at General Motors, it always happened on a Friday before a holiday weekend. And, uh, you know, so, so the difference that we had when we actually got Thing, when, when problems happen, you got to have somebody there that is on it. And so the process that you have to cross the border should have local expertise that allows you to tackle those problems when they occur and don't let them sit. Okay. John Taylor, Wayne State University. So just to check, are you a student or a, or a lecturer at Wayne State? So. I can play either role you want, whatever you want. <laughs> Uh, LTL has been, you know, a challenge in Mexico as it's developed over, over, or not developed over many years. I'm um, just wondering, any of the panel members, what your experience is with, with LTL aside from the issues Jeff mentioned about about uh, uh, damage issues and so on. But what's the status of LTL and and at this point? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. I mean, for us, we, we see it very limited, non-existent. I mean, as we plan our networks, we're planning our networks without LTL, you know, looking at what we can do to ourselves, you know, running consolidation sweeps, you know, what would be similar to LTL. But for, for us, it's um, not a lot of activity or, or work that we're, that we're seeing in, in that area with them. From a supplier standpoint, <clears throat> we use it very minimally. Uh, avoid it at all costs unless it's the you know the last option that's available. From an intermodal perspective, yeah, we, we don't see a lot of LTL either. I, I think, like Jeff said, you know, we work pretty closely with customers. Um, we'll do a lot of milk runs, a lot of multi stops. I mean, sometimes we can do six six pickups or deliveries in a move prior. So it, it, it kind of helps circumvent it. Um, but we don't do specific, we don't see a lot of LTL specifically in intermodal. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, a uh, question from my side, sorry. A uh, question from my side really is, we've talked very much about the North American uh, kind of link but isn't it, you know, is it a very global supply chain uh, to and from Mexico? I, I can't remember which car maker it was necessarily, but someone was telling me their, their supply chain is kind of Germany, Mexico, and China, and I can't remember in which order it was uh, that they were supplying the plant and parts from, uh, you know, going from Mexico to China and Germany and Germany to, China, to Mexico, et cetera. So is anyone, you know, looking at the, is it a, is it a very global supply chain and is anyone involved in a, in the whole global supply chain for them. Well, I'm, my, sorry. My, my perspective is it is global and it'll become more global. I don't think you're gonna put that genie back in the bottle. I, I, um, it, it will always be a more north-south kind of flow, but the, the, uh, the ports coming, the east and west ports coming in from international markets, I believe will continue to grow because of 
th there will always be countries, in my opinion, that will have competitive advantage in certain commodities. Um, and those commodities will need to be imported into Mexico like they were used to be and still are imported to the United States. So I, I believe it will continue to become more global. And, um, but, but the ultimate flow, I don't think, I, don't, I think the ultimate flow of the finished good will always be, you know, the north south bound uh, routes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know for us, we see it definitely as an opportunity to get more into South America. Uh, with some of their agreements with Brazil, uh, for instance, that's that's a major initiative for us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, we're seeing, you know, the Mexican government, you know, doing a lot of work with the Mexican, uh, the west side of the country, the port there, ports there, uh, you know, deepening the, uh, the, the ports so that the bigger ships can come in, the rail lines connecting, uh, bringing that material, you know, uh, with the rail line, bringing it down to Toluca so it can get into the... Uh, central part of the country. So, yeah, there's a lot of investment in, you know, from, you know, coming in from Asia into Mexico is definitely, you know, is growing. Okay, thank you. Is there uh, any other questions? Oh, the young lady at the front. Do you, do you see NIC becoming um, more popular with carriers in Mexico? Well, I, I didn't hear that. Could you repeat yeah. it? Neek, did you see that becoming more co popular with carriers? Neek or Nick? Is CTPAT comparison in Mexico? Right. Okay. You know, I, I'm not sure, actually. I don't know. Rob, you're here. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, at, at this point, no, it, I, I haven't seen it, but it's not to say it's not out there. Is there anyone else wanting to make a. Uh, does anyone else about, know about that and want to make a point on that? I, I will tell you that my, yeah. m one of my colleagues in the back said, shook her head yes, so yes. <laughs> Just, <laughs> please, please don't ask me to expand. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, yeah, ba basically, uh, just very brief on that point. Um, neck, it's basically, basically neck, it's called the CT. CTPAP program for, for now for Mexican companies. Uh, although it's, it's, in, it's in the first phase where it's more uh, focused on the manufacturing sites, the second phase is now for the transportation and logistics companies, but it is basically a, a copy-paste, let's say, for uh, certifications that now the majority of the companies in Mexico as manufacturers are asking for transportation companies to have at least for this coming year. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Thanks. Uh, question to the panel from me again, uh, based a little bit on what, what kind of Jeff said about automotive being one of the most complex industries. Uh, but obviously, you know, the, the Mexican US trade is, is not just automotive. Um, is there anything we can learn, or are we studying or benchmarking other industries? Do we still consider automotive to be one of the better U.S.-Mexico uh, logistics kind of chains or operations? Pat, Jeff, firstly. Uh, yeah, I, my, my opinion, we use automotive as the benchmark with other industries. So, mm. you know, it's, it's not that we do things perfectly in automotive, but it, it is a, it, it's a much more mature market, in my opinion, with the Mexico trade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would echo Jeff's comments. I mean, I think we, we view automotive as the benchmark. I think other companies, you know, have approached us in other industries, and, and, and they really wanted to learn from auto, automotive. You know, when you, when you look at intermodal, you know, it was brought up earlier today that intermodal service for auto parts is fairly mature in Mexico, um, but there's a lot of industries where, where they're just starting to look at it. You know, a, a lot of other... Um, Consumer, consumer goods and different products, and, and a lot of them look at, at intermodal, I mean, at the automotive industry, not only as the benchmark, but they want to learn how they've been so successful uh, implementing that type of service in, in a really challenging, you know, inventory environment. 
So, yeah, I mean, Orbis, about half of our sales is, is tied to the automotive market, and a lot of our other uh, customers do come to us and, and ask about, you know, how does automotive do it, or how does Ford do it, how does GM do it? Um, but interestingly enough, on the aftermarket side of things, it's actually a lot that the automotive industry can use, uh, could learn from uh, some of the retailers and how they get their single products uh, to stores and, and use that model. So. Um, and the majority of the time, yes, automotive is the standard, but I do think there are some pockets of information that could be pulled from some of the other customers. Yeah, just to kind of carry over from, from what the rest say, absolutely, uh, they're looking at automotive. But what we also see, though, is sometimes uh, it doesn't necessarily, the automotive solution doesn't, you know, mean that you, this is what they're wanting. And, you know, we have to be cautious sometimes to fork to force the automotive solution on these other industries. So they absolutely look at us the benchmark, but you know, they want to be cautious and make sure that they're applying it and, and, and using what, what they see is best for them and not saying, hey, whatever's perfect for automotive is perfect for me. So kind of cautious in that at the same time. Okay, and on that, on that kind of point um, about uh, just forcing your ideas you know, onto other industries, uh, what about, you know, bringing, you know, your, your kind of North American companies or North American based companies. Can you pick up your, what you do in North America uh, and pretty well replicate, replicate it into, into Mexico? Or do you have to completely redesign your networks and what you're doing uh, and your strategies for Mexico? Or is it a, a kind of mix of the two? I think we take it as a mix of the two. When you're looking at, you know, running milk runs in the United States or Canada versus Mexico, it's very similar. Warehousing, you know, and we, I think we try and look at it as standardization, but also a mix of customization where, you know, the culture is different. Uh, some of the, the politics and, you know, the, the government regulations are different. So, you know, uh, underlying, yeah, it's, it's a both where there's, you know, you want to operate it the same but understanding the cultural differences and, and you know, the uniqueness in, each, in the individual country. So it's probably a combination of both. But is, is, there, a, is there a kind of, I don't know, an estimate you can make on percentage? Is it 40% 40, 40 kind of, you know, standard rider or Penske or UPDS or whatever? Or is it, you know, kind of, you know, 80% what you already do and, the, and you're tweaking it to 20% for Mexico? I, I guess... That's a hard one to answer. I, I don't know if I'd give percentages, but I will tell you yeah. the strategies to drive improvement are probably very similar. So cube, density in a container, or container. So I think those strategies to try to drive cost effectiveness, if you will, which is a primary metric we all know, mm -hmm. are, are similar. But the as you bake it down to how you're going to go execute the route, to Brad's point, I think you've there, there are regulations and other issues infrastructure issues, things you got to take into consideration that are unique to that locale. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things you have to be careful of is trying to uh, engineer a solution or come up with a solution, you know, here in the U.S. You know, the go and see practice is key. You, you know, you have to understand what it's like, but that's like in any part of the country, uh, you know, United States, Canada, you have to go and see what's unique to that area. So, yeah, I don't know what that percent is, you know, but, but yeah, you get, you got to go there and, and understand it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions? Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Gilberto Cuellar with Maxion Wheels. Uh, question for Mike. Um, with 80% uh, of the uh, freight crossing in and out of Mexico to the U.S., uh, crossing via truck. Uh, do you, uh, and, and for, for those, I guess, that can afford being on the highway because of uh, shorter transit times, value of goods, et cetera, do you see uh, any true collaboration between the rail underlying providers to extend the reach of the intermodal <laughs> providers? Uh, to different places that right now are basically not uh, cost effective for uh, end customers, like in our case, per se. Yeah, that's a great question. I, you know, I think, um, you know, I mentioned before, um, 
the automotive industry has been using intermodal in and out of Mexico for some time, but the intermodal service uh, continues to evolve and continues to extend its reach. Um, you know, if you look at it, uh, I mentioned in my presentation, there's uh, a new service on the Ferromex to Monterey. Um, somebody mentioned yesterday there's a new service to Salau. So I think, I think all uh, the railroads, you know, are, are looking at, you know, they see intermodal as a growth engine that can help with some of the highway conversions, and they want to develop new services that only, not only get to new markets, but are also truck competitive uh, to help with that conversion. So it's definitely something that's going on. I think it'll continue to evolve. Um, you know, I, I think you'll see more and more new service, uh, new locations, new service offerings, premium um, type products uh, to address that. And, uh, and again, we touched upon it, but the human resources, uh, what are the skills that are required in, in Mexico? You know, in, in America, it's almost primarily drivers that we want more than anything else. But what do you need in Mexico? Is it, is it at the kind of more basic levels, uh, at drivers and things like that? Uh, do they have the, the top-end supply chain expertise? What are the requirements that you need uh, and is needed for automotive logistics in, in Mexico? All, all the above. I mean, it, 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 just, just like, not, not to be trite about it, but it, it's just like, in many respects, like we have here. We have design engineers that we recruit that are educated, many of them U.S. educated, but they are degreed professionals. We have, we have the need for drivers, we have the need for warehouse workers, and just about everything in between. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a... It's just a smaller version of what we need here. <laughs> you know, I agree with that. I, I think the other thing that's a little bit unique is, you know, when doing, we really look for good relationship builders as well. So, I mean, all those other criteria certainly hold, but, you know, there's so much activity, so much, uh, so many different transactions. The relationship in Mexico seems critical, and, and we're always looking for individuals that we feel can build effective, uh, effective relationships with the different parties involved, great communication skills, as that seems to help drive a lot of the activity. Yeah, I, I totally agree on that. You know, the communication uh, with, uh, with our, our friends in, in the U.S. and in Canada and, and open, being able to communicate back and forth is, is those people are the, the key assets. You know, you're seeing certain parts of the country grow faster than their infrastructure allows with the people. So, you know, there's a lot of push on, you know, what type of education in certain parts, but, but clearly the communication, you know, good communications is, is key, but that's probably true anywhere. Okay. Any last questions? Okay. Possibly, we, oh, sorry, I didn't see you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, one more for Jeff. Yeah. Um, We've seen the, uh, uh, the investments, the, uh, the development in Mexico in terms of, we've seen a lot about uh, highway developments, uh, intermodal rail operations. Basically, you know, on the intermodal side, we see a lot of the uh, plug and play components uh, being uh, shipped uh, again back and forth. What do you see in Mexico in terms of development for uh, uh, commodities, for uh, steel uh, for the for the big uh, commodities what do you see in terms of uh, infrastructure being developed as well is it at the same pace than other types of terminals and things like this that's it's a great question I don't know if I'm qualified to answer that one um, I, I I would I would imagine there is a conference right now somewhere talking about that exact topic and I'm sure that people are putting up maps like we've put up saying it's a huge growing market we got to be there I just don't know. I don't have numbers around it, nor do I, nor do I know the business model that they'll deploy in Mexico, which could be fundamentally different when you talk about steel than other markets in the in the world. Okay. Well, thank you very much. But just you know, one of the things that uh, you know occurs to me is uh, cultural differences, uh, and I've got my own kind of little story where uh, I was in Mexico, and I was really pleased that you know how well I was being received by everyone. In fact. They kept saying to me, Louis, you're tonto. And I thought, that's great. You know, I'm a, you know, it means loyalty. Someone who's a good friend, someone you can depend on, someone that you know, can always be there when you're in trouble. 
I thought that was so nice that they called me that until I realized it went, meant moron or idiot. So, <laughs> so But it's, it is cult, cultural differences, but cultural similarities, because I think there's people around the world who think I'm a moron. So that's <laughs> kind of good to know. So I'd like to thank the panel very much for their, for their presentations and answers. Thank you. And if you'd like to join us for the lunch, which is hosted by XPO Logistics, uh, and back in this room for a surprise crossfire uh, just after lunch. Thank you.